good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for all your contributions. Thank you very much for coming here today. Thank you very much for organizing. I think that many people with whom I had a brief chat before feel that like it's very kind of like very very interesting, very inspiring, but also sad space in a way today that we share these different um, the different stories, different geographies, different voices, and I'm very grateful for being part of that. My name is Alexey Berisyanak. I'm a curator and writer. Currently, I'm a fellow of CAC Arts Link and Verily Center for Arts and Politics in New York. Uh, and I'm extremely glad to share the space with you, Leah, uh, today in a short conversation. Yeah, thank you. I'm Leah Feldman. I teach at the University of Chicago and recently doing some more arts collaborations. And it's been really a joy for me to be here. Um, you all are incredibly inspiring. Um, and this has really been, our, we're talking today about unlearning geopolitics. And for me, as an instructor, uh, the process of unlearning is really crucial to decolonial praxis. It's crucial to abolitionist uh, pedagogy in the classroom. And I'm often thinking about not only what I teach, but how we teach. Um, and so being here with you all and thinking about the kind of connections across spaces that we're creating is, is an act of unlearning geopolitics, right? Unlearning these given systems and, and figuring out how to work creatively within them. And so I wanted to open this up to you, Alexei. Um, I spent a little time this weekend reading your work and it's been so incredible um, to get to know it. And I wanted to ask you about your recent uh, exhibition um, infrastructures and solidarities beyond the post-Soviet condition. And I wanted to think about this through the lens of unlearning. You're introducing um, the notion of uh, infrastructures in a way to think about colonial resource production and also new alternative infrastructures and how we can repurpose that. So I'd love to hear more about, about that project. Thank you very much. I think I would maybe actually start also kind of weaving and referring also to Isis Basdariva, um, kind of like very touching and kind of uh, proposals that and, and I think and I believe that uh, I also try in my work to follow this idea somehow like not to pathologize trauma like in the in the in this very doomed and dark times, but also trying to kind of to understand the framework how. Uh, kind of violence which operate on different velocities as kind of immediate but also slow violence and kind of to, to find and articulate those um, frameworks which enables them but also uh, those frameworks which help us to think how to resist and how to uh, how to resist uh, many different things but also including this kind of um, geopolitical terms which actually also produce different kind of forms of violence. So I think uh, with, uh, uh, personally, I'm coming from uh, Minsk, Belarus, and currently based in Vienna, and as kind of part of uh, uh, different uh, multiple groups who've been part of the social uprising in Belarus in 2020. I think it was both, for many of us, a process of learning, but which I actually find uh, more important is a process of unlearning, in a way, because, uh, and this is, I hope we will have some time to open it up a little bit, because I think many of, the, of this terminology, which is kind of implied uh, from the outside, but also kind of proliferated uh, inside of those contexts, kind of uh, um, really uh, makes uh, things more complicated, like to, uh, how to how to proceed and how to imagine different kind of futures. So uh, the way how me and my co-curator of the exhibition, Antonina Stebur, the exhibition which happened in National uh, Gallery of Art in Vilnius, Lithuania, um, and kind of that was a subtitle that you shared, and the kind of the title of the, exhi of the exhibition was "If Disrupted, It Becomes Visible." So we kind of our idea was to um, to speak about uh, different infrastructures that were taken uh, both uh, in terms like something that we refer to as uh, invasive infrastructures, referring to many other scholars who've been studying uh, them, uh, but also as fugitive infrastructures. So basically what like different ways of struggles and also um, um, different uh, forms of resistance. So kind of the title gave us an idea that actually uh, in the different moments when like infrastructure or uh, infrastructure can be disrupted and it kind of becomes much more tangible and uh, uh, something that can be uh, seen like the way how, how it works. 
and which can also operate on body level, bodily level, it can operate in the different temporalities and spaces which are not immediately kind of which uh, kind of go beyond human perception. So for us, um, kind of learning and, and also unlearning uh, those frameworks which were not coming only from Belarus but actually from, the, from different geographies, from Baltic countries, Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Georgia, kind of which found themselves in this very complicated space between Russian imperialism but also uh, kind of liberal market and kind of neoliber neoliberalism from the other side and kind of trying to search different ways how those infrastructures can be found but also what um, kind of different groups and different approaches can kind of inform us how to resist them, how, how to resist this violence. And uh, maybe I also would like to kind of to maybe to mirror this question back to you and uh, also I'm curious to, to know like what actually is this kind of um, your educational work but also your curatorial and publishing work uh, how, how, like what are these notions that inform it, like what, what the notion of unlearning uh, brings to your work. Mm. Thank you, Alexei. Um, yeah, so I, I'm working on this project now with the art, artist collective Slavs and Tatars, and we're, we're, we made a, a, a book, an art book, which was styled after kind of a reading primer, an alphabet book. It's called Azvuka Strikes Back. It's, it's a kind of un, un alphabet book or an un, un reading primer. And we looked at Soviet children's books and, and the project was an idea to how to decolonize the Soviet children's book, but also thinking about the script reforms in the Soviet Union. So, and it's a sound book. So we are attempting to think about how to give sounds um, other lives and think about sounds as capacious beyond their being confined into different alphabets. That is the way that, is the way that um, alphabet systems and alphabet reforms, so there were many alphabet reforms in the, in the Soviet Union, both, both putting scripts into Cyrillic and then now, now into Latin and various forms of Latin script. And that changed readerships, made texts inaccessible to people. So also, it's about um, accesses to, to access to infrastructure. And so we were thinking about um, how uh, sounds could escape those alphabets. And so it's this kind of children's book story. And the pro project there too was to try to translate a complex history that is of the alphabet reforms and the way that um, levied power and, 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 and um, consolidated power within the Soviet Union. For example, one of the things that it did was inhibit um, uh, revolutionary movements among, say, pan-Turkic groups, for example, across the empire by um, putting, script, putting all the languages into different forms of the Latin script and then Cyrillic script. So we were thinking about forms of solidarity and how they are mediated through um, through uh, scriptural histories in that sense. But it also relates to this notion of infrastructure. And I think one of the things I, I found really compelling about one of the projects you were talking about was um, the use of of telegram and telegram channels as a means of kind of disrupting again um, those the the kind of hold on the print press and also the the restriction on internet usage and I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that project and yeah. mm -hmm. maybe I also kind of come back to the exhibition uh, in a way that me and my collaborator Antonina Stebur uh, kind of while doing research for the exhibition for, for us this notion of uh, anti-imperial disruption was uh, quite important and I believe that um, we were speaking about anti-imperialism as a kind of certain praxis which has a history and I, I believe that also like your work actually speaks a lot uh, about different legacies in the uh, geography which was shaped by Russian Empire um, colonialism and for us, for example, it was very important to see how uh, different anti-imperial uh, practices can can be resonating with contemporary moment and and or like find vocabulary how to speak about that. And uh, uh, for us, while working in the exhibition, one of the one of the objects that was also which was a. Um, an object which was a, a control a railway control cabinet uh, was very important, and this railway control cabinet was a, an object uh, part of the infrastructure, kind of a display of infrastructure that was attacked by 
uh, both uh, hacker group uh, kind of originating from the Belarus 2020 cyber partisans, which uh, I believe that you might uh, heard about because it uh, um, the group did many different like cyber attacks for the whole uh, kind of digital realm of the uh, Belarusian uh, state. And, but also this control cabinet was attacked uh, physically by uh, many, many uh, so-called Belarusian railway partisans. So for us it was actually very interesting to see how and kind of following the um, research by prominent Ukrainian researcher Svetlana Matvienka to show uh, what this notion of cyber war, which was also quite central to the exhibition, how it implies different, um, how, uh, how it puts together both digital and kinetic violence and also different temporalities of, uh, of those violence into uh, something. So that object for us, which was, as we kind of put in the exhibition essay, was something that um, kind of formed this kind of uh, anti-imperial disruptions. And then we were speaking about many different ones. And maybe also I think that's also interesting to mention, I think in this context now uh, here, I believe that also as, as we are following, there are many, many debates now uh, which kind of uh, try to see how decolonial frameworks are might or might not work uh, in the context of Eastern Europe, post-socialism, post-Soviet, and uh, I think that this is also very interesting, like to speak uh, to speak about it in the terms of like either decolonial or anti-imperial, because it's also a very com complicated topic which needs a lot of um, preliminary remarks to that. And uh, I think that also like maybe referring to the second part of the title, which was kind of beyond the post-Soviet conditions. I'm actually also curious from your side, from your experience, uh, and kind of coming back to this notion of unlearning geopolitics. How, what is your kind of, uh, in your research, how you would approach these very um, com like uh, terms that imply both uh, space and time, and what would be your uh, relation to them? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and the way you were framing it as well in terms of the of, of building solidarities, I think, is really important. Um, one of the projects I'm involved with right now is a collection of anti-colonial manifestos, and the idea there is to bring many manifestos, like in some ways, what this this um, this assembly is doing uh, together over the course of the 20th century across space and time, you know, from the early 20th century, say, uh, revolutionary Armenia to Mexico, um, and to put those into conversation. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that is, we share in our work is, is, is trying to rethink the term uh, post-Soviet and term post-socialist, and what that term, I mean, that term comes out of a moment of the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War and this kind of marking of the rise of of, of capi neoliberal capitalism to universal dominance and what kind of blockages in turn that formation creates, right? What that geopolitical concept then when it takes on life and how that inhibits forms of solidarity and inhibits ways of thinking about connection. Um, so I wanted to kind of throw that question back to you and, and how your work is trying to reimagine um, alternative possibilities beyond the post-Soviet. You talk about alternative futures that, um, that can be projected from, from rethinking the post-socialist, and I wanna, I wanna hear more about that. Um, I would maybe put it in the following way, that I think that especially with, uh, like, especially after the invasion of Russia to Ukraine, uh, I think for many people, uh, like, it would kind of manifest the, like, the end of, like, actually both post-Soviet and post-socialist, but, uh, and then there were, I think, I mean, also, like, historically there were different attempts to question this notion, uh, for various reasons, but I think that for, it became, like, very obvious now that, of course, we are somewhere else, and this is, uh, I think, a big challenge also, like, to find the proper vocabulary, but there are, of course, very clear reasons why this term uh, is problematic now, right? And I believe that many, like, my colleagues and uh, uh, many artists, scholars, thinkers, philosophers, activists are really doing a lot now, um, and I believe this is, like, very important uh, moment to uh, kind of trying to figure out how those 
legacies, but also futures of movements uh, in those geographies are can be somehow uh, finding different ways how to align with different anti-imperialist and anti-colonial struggles. And of course, it's not an easy uh, process. It's a, it's a lot about learning and learning. It's a lot about kind of aligning with different uh, movements which might need uh, space to understand why they can be kind of working together and what uh, what is kind of anti-colonial, anti-imperialist agenda to that respect. And I believe this is uh, extremely important now when we follow different, like kind of these geopolitical catastrophes where, which are kind of also have the same root now, like the colonialism from where they're struggling. So I believe that this kind of alignment between, I don't know, between Kiev, Tbilisi, Gaza, uh, many other places is something that is very challenging and absolutely important, essential for this moment. Thank you.